there's a lot of information about the two questions that you'll see on the April 2nd ballot. Uh, first question is a capital referendum um, for construction and remodeling, and the second is an operational uh, referendum. I'm going to go into some pretty decent detail about both of those. Um, and the format for this evening is I'll go over that presentation. Uh, we want everyone to be able to have the opportunity to get their questions answered. So we have a number of people here this evening, uh, between myself, additional administrators, school board members, representatives from Findorf, which is our construction management firm that we're uh, engaged with, and EUA, Ascension and Architects, which is the design firm we're engaged with, as well as someone from Baird Financial, uh, who can answer questions around kind of the tax impact here as well. Um, and we want to be able to give everyone an individual, you know, a chance to answer, ask and, and give answers to their questions, okay? So that's uh, concluding the presentation. We'll break and there'll be people in here, there'll be people in the hallway that you can go and ask questions to. So, um, what I'm going to go over is kind of the, the, the groundwork that led us to the recommendation to the school board uh, to pursue a referendum. Um, and a question that has been raised is, we just recently had a referendum, didn't that take care of all the needs of the district? Um, I, you know, really you could look at that 2015 referendum as a phase one, realistically. It was intended to address the uh, immediate and, and pending um, elementary enrollment issues that were occurring or, and that we've actually realized uh, in the district. Um, and as those same students will matriculate through our system, they're going to put pressure on our existing buildings. Um, so since that 2015 referendum, there's still been quite a bit of work that has occurred. Uh, when I first came here, we had to redraw elementary boundaries for Eagle Point and Windsor. Um, we've also engaged the Morrisonville community in um, discussing what are the long-term prospects for Morrisonville. Morrisonville celebrates 100 years this year. Um, Knowing that we had facility issues, you know, we do have uh, we do have new facilities in Windsor and Eagle Point, but we do have other buildings like Yahara, Olin Education Center, Morrisonville. So we engage with um, by putting out an RFP, a request for proposal, to identify a construction management firm and a design firm to help conduct a, um, a facility study to look walk through our buildings, identify how do they. Uh, how do they meet capacity needs? Um, how do they meet code and ADA compliance? Um, are there some educational adequacy issues that we should be aware of as well? So we had them do that study. They used the, the study from 2014 from the first CAC as the basis of that, and then either confirmed or affirmed some of those issues that were identified back in 2014, as well as identified some additional new issues. So with that facility study, that was a key component to the, to the information that the CAC, the Community Advisory Committee, which was reconvened um, back in this past August, uh, we brought together over 40 community residents. It was actually a really nice cross-section, uh, representative cross-section of our community. We had um, some folks who were multi-generational in the DeForest School District. We had some uh, staff, we had existing current parents, we had individuals who recently moved to the community who didn't have kids but were planning on having children. Uh, we had some um, senior residents who moved into the community whose kids were already grown and wouldn't have students participating um, or, or accessing our, our, our school system here. Uh, so it was really a nice representative group of, of our community um, and they really did a lot of work. In fact, uh, they were given homework between the nine meetings that they had. Each of the nine meetings were scheduled to be two and a half hours. I don't know if we, and we have a couple CAC members here, they can probably confirm that I don't know if we had any of them actually stay to that two and a half hour mark. They probably, yeah, there's some shaking in the heads. They, they, most of them went over that amount. And on top of that, we, were, we gave them homework to study prior to that. So to their credit, they were very invested in the process. They were very invested in the work. And I think as a result, they, they put forward um, some very thoughtful, deliberate, um, and comprehensive uh, solutions. Um, so again, they met nine times over between August and January. And then 
uh, in November, December, they began to test what they, some of the solutions or the solutions that they wanted to bring forward. The three things that they primarily focused on during this work, and this is really drilling it down to three basic things, doesn't really give it credit to the amount of work they really did, was they looked at the overall building conditions of our existing facilities, um, they looked at our kind of our long-term plan for capital maintenance. They looked at modern learning environments. How do uh, the learning environments in some of our older um, schools compare to what's recently been built? And then a big driver when you're looking at long-term facility planning is enrollment growth. What's the impact of what's projected for enrollment in our school district, and how will that put pressure or may not put pressure on our existing facilities? You can find all of their work, and I'm talking all the presentations, all the materials, all the reports that they had to go through online. If you do a quick search for CAC, you can access all that information that they had to pour through during those nine years. So as I mentioned, enrollment growth is really probably the biggest factor when you're looking at long-term facility planning. Um, this this is the enrollment projections from 2014, from the first CAC uh, back in 2014. They received enrollment projections from the UW Applied Population Lab. So these longer colored lines are from the UW Applied Population Lab. Their most aggressive projections are the yellow line. Their least progressive or aggressive uh, projections is this purple line. They also got projections from uh, a company called Springstead, which is that short orange line. So as you can see, over time, from 2015 to projected out to 2025, we were projected to see uh, that type of growth. This dark blue line, that's our actual enrollment in 4K through um, 12th grade. So to me, what this my takeaway from this is they were spot on knowing that we were going to see enrollment growth. Um, to, in their defense, the toughest part to project is how fast or how slow that actually occurs. There's lots of factors, economic um, uh, development is, is a key indicator that typically impacts how fast or slow, how quickly houses get uh, developed. Those are the kind of things that really um, can impact how fast or slow. But again, to me, the key takeaway is their projections that our school district was poised for uh, enrollment growth came to fruition. And we have actually seen that. I can tell you that when you look at our uh, kindergarten through fourth grade right now, we don't have a class under 280 <coughs> students, um, with our largest class being our kindergarten class of 311. You compare that to the fifth grade through 12th grade currently, we have one 280 in there. The rest of them are. 250 to 260, and that has traditionally been what we've seen uh, in our district probably in the last decade. Um, but certainly, we're seeing classes now that are 20, 30 students more than what has been the norm here. Um, so again, which again supports these projections. We've since engaged with uh, getting new projections with Roffer and Associates. It's a gentleman by the name of Mark Roffers. Uh, the benefit of working with his projections is Mark Roffers works with a number of municipalities in Dane County. Specifically, he works with Windsor, the village of Windsor, and the village of the forest. And what is beneficial in his work is he has access and intimate knowledge about housing developments, a uh, number of permits that are being approved. He knows from the, those municipalities um, when developments are primed and ready to start, when services are being brought out to those particular developments. So he, he knows when um, new develop, housing developments are going to start and the impact it's going to have on our, our area's population. And he uses that information with some other formula and calculations to identify um, uh, what it's going to do to our enrollment. He also looks at existing neighborhoods and has a calculation that uh, looks at neighborhoods turning over. So you might have um, older neighborhoods where Residents, their kids have already gone through the system. They decide to downsize or move to somewhere warmer, um, which after this winter, I guess I can't really blame them. Um, but those neighborhoods turn over, and not always, but in many cases, you might have a younger couple uh, moving into those homes. And he does factor that into his, his uh, projections. So based off of Mark Roffer's projections, by 2030, 
uh, we are going to be at over 5,000 students. That's the projections uh, when you look at all the information he, he utilizes to come up with these. Um, based off of these projections, uh, we, we are projected to be over capacity by 2025 at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Um, he does only look at kindergarten through 12th grade. So when you look at these numbers compared to the, the other projections, Applied Population Lab looks at 4K through 12th grade. Those numbers are look higher, but when you add 4K, our actual 4K numbers into this, um, you'll get the same numbers. But he looks only at kindergarten through 12th grade because the district's facilities actually only house kindergarten through 12th grade. Our current 4K programming is um, community-based. We have lots of community partners um, in the child care centers that actually run and house the 4K program. So again, his projections have us at um, five, over 5,000 students by 2030. Currently, the capacity of our existing buildings uh, is about 4,000 students. Um, I did mention that our current kindergarten is 311. As a frame of reference for you to kind of, uh, again, give you another example of our growing enrollment, when our current, today's kindergartners, when they were four-year-old kindergartners last year, they were at about 284 students. We typically see that number increase when they come into kindergarten for a variety of reasons. This year's 4K class is 294, I believe. Um, so we anticipate next year's kindergarten is going to be a very similar, potentially around 300 students again. So that enrollment growth doesn't look like it's going to be uh, changing or that it's a bubble. It looks like that's really going to be the norm for us of class sizes somewhere between 280 and 310. Uh, another reason for uh, this enrollment growth is the housing growth that we've seen. This chart shows uh, the total approved unbuilt housing units. Back in 2014, there were 2,300 approved but unbuilt housing units. Um, in 2018, that number is just under 2,700. We've all seen the, the, the housing developments that have popped up in our, in our community, both in DeForest and Windsor. Um, so what this says is not only have those housing developments been built now, because many of those would have been in that 2300 number, but they've added even more on top of uh, what has already been built, bringing us to that nearly 2700 um, approved but unbuilt housing units still to come online. Mark Rockers also looks at, this is the district boundaries, he looks at specific neighborhoods that are poised to come online and be developed. These red areas are neighborhoods that will, uh, that he projects will bring a substantial number of students to our school district and those currently are, are housing units that are not yet developed. This one over here is over by Pumpkin Hollow. Um, as soon as the, uh, the services are brought to that area then we're going to see that begin to get developed um, and will be a pretty substantial housing development. As I said the CAC uh, studied enrollment. They also studied the conditions of our buildings. Um, yeah, particularly in Morrisonville, the Home Education Center here, the middle school and high school, there are a number of code ADA issues that exist. Um, as an example, at uh, Morrisonville, uh, the challenges of Morrisonville, it's a multi-level building. It services about 50 to 60 kids annually. To retrofit that to have an elevator to make ADA compliant is not really cost effective when you consider the number of students it serves. Um, in addition, if there were a student or an individual even if we could get them into the building, if there were an individual in a powered wheelchair, the hallways are actually too narrow to be able to, to um, effectively move around uh, in those hallways. Again, that's, it's a 100-year-old building. They weren't constructed to accommodate those types of needs at that time and certainly um, present ADA compliance issues. The whole education center, similarly, same kinds of issues where um, there isn't an elevator. An individual with mobility issues would actually have to go outside of the building to access the different levels. Um, in addition, a number of our buildings do have obsolete or uh, systems that are um, approaching the end of life for many of them, uh, whether it's leaks or we're beginning to have challenges finding uh, parts because those parts are no longer being made. Um, when we look at a high school in particular, the high school currently has capacity for about 1,300 students. Um, we're about over 1,000 students there right now. So really, capacity 
isn't the primary issue at the high school, but the commons, the classroom capacity isn't the primary issue at the high school, it's the common spaces. The existing cafeteria, the library, locker rooms, those spaces that are used by m most students, they're undersized for the number of students we currently have, and will certainly be undersized for the, the students, the number of students we're projected to have at the high school in the, in the future. And then failing infrastructure, a good example of that is the, the high school pool, which was built in 1969. Um, there, in addition to kind of the systems that are kind of coming to the end of its useful life at the pool, um, the, the actual structure of the pool has some uh, significant issues. Um, probably the biggest issue is that there is a portion of that pool that is sunk. So a pool, when it sits vacant and still, what you want to have happen for the filtration is the water gently kind of rolls off of every side of the pool and then goes in through the filtration system. Because that pool has a, a side of it that is sunk, when no one's in it and it's perfectly still, there's a dry corner because gravity is pulling the water down towards the other end. Um, that's not good for the overall system. It certainly uh, speaks volumes about the overall condition of that, uh, of that pool. So those are just examples of things that the CAC studied when they looked at the overall conditions of our buildings and some of the issues related to just the age of the buildings. doesn't mean that we've not tried to maintain these, but um, at a certain point, just like in our homes, um, we have to replace our windows, we have to um, do things to our homes, and because some of those pieces just kind of hit the end of their useful life. So after studying all of that, the CAC did make a recommendation. They, they actually, we actually tested two plans, a base plan of about $121 million and a comprehensive plan, which included additional um, components to it for about almost $137 million. Um, they also su uh, supported that the need to um, have operational dollars for uh, the components of those plans. We did test those. Both of those plans, the base and the comprehensive, um, we got 1,300 responses on our survey, which was a pretty good uh, response rate. Um, of those 1,300 responses, 75% said that they would support the base plan. 59% said they would support the, uh, the more comprehensive plan. So based off of that response, the CAC felt like there was, there was some momentum in the community to, to, to make a recommendation to the board to pursue a, rec, uh, a referendum. So ultimately, they struggled. They struggled with, do they just move forward the base plan? They felt really strongly about many of the aspects of the comprehensive plan. So at the end of the day, they said, we would support anything minimally from the base to the comprehensive. Administration took that, we reviewed the survey results, and, and forwarded a final recommendation to the board of the base plan. Um, base plan plus the rest of the educational spaces that weren't included in the base plan, and then high school parking as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over the, the components of what's being proposed uh, for the uh, capital referendum fund. So one of the things that will be required uh, with this capital project is a change in our grade configuration. Currently we have uh, four elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. Under this proposal, uh, we would have we would move to three elementary schools. We would close Morrisonville. Again, the CAC looked at that, the cost effectiveness of uh, doing renovations and bringing that up to code uh, didn't seem cost effective for the number of students it currently serves. And because of site limitations, the investment in that, in that site, it's too small, the building's too small to really make it useful in increasing capacity. So closing Morrisonville, um, we would have, leading us to three elementary schools, to make capacity space at the elementary schools, we would pull fourth grade out. Uh, to make capacity space at the middle school, we would pull fifth and sixth grade out and build a new intermediate school for fourth through sixth grade. Uh, they did look at that. There was a lot of positives to that, not only just increasing capacity, but also when you look at developmentally, fourth through sixth grade seem closer together developmentally than we currently have with fifth through eighth grade and then we would still maintain our high school. The new intermediate school, uh, the CAC, again, I give them a lot of credit. They did, they were very thoughtful. They threw out a lot of potential solutions. They looked at, can we build a new high school and move all the levels up? Um, but when they started looking at the cost of construction for a high school or a new middle school, they started to realize that 
to build a new high school or a new middle school typically costs more than an elementary or an intermediate school. And part of that's driven because you have more specialized programming at the middle and high school level. With specialized programming comes the need for specialized spaces, which increases the cost. So um, they believe that building a new intermediate school um, on land that the district currently owns, that was the other issue that they, that they came upon uh, in looking at a new middle school or high school, requires considerably more land. Um, to purchase land, that would be an additional cost that we would have to try to figure out how to cover. Um, under this proposal, the new intermediate school would go on land that the district currently owns. Uh, the district currently owns 66 acres. There's 26 here over by uh, Windsor Elementary off of North Town Road, just south of this uh, kind of wood line or tree line here. North of that, we own another 40 acres, which is the FFA um, uh, farm lab. Um, so we would build a new intermediate school here for grades four through six. Um, as I mentioned, we would close Holland because of the, the cost. It's just not effective, cost effective to, to make those renovations there. Similarly, we would close the Holland Education Center, which currently houses district operations. Uh, the cost of um, doing something on that site uh, just doesn't make sense uh, when there might be more effective ways to um, utilize existing space with some renovations. To, to move that and then take that older, less efficient building offline. So by closing the whole of Education Center, we would build a new maintenance building here for um, our maintenance equipment, shop, and receiving, and utilizing this, this land that we currently own here um, in Windsor. Here at Morrisonville, um, the CAC looked at educational ad adequacy. How does the learning environment look here compared to at our other elementary schools? So what's being proposed at Yahara is um, renovating all of the classrooms and doing a heavy renovation to kindergarten classrooms. If you are at Windsor or at Eagle Point, you will see that kindergarten classrooms are typically larger and their proximity to restrooms um, is usually closer, and that's by design. Um, so what's being proposed here is that we would move kindergarten to the far end of the building and renovate those classrooms because there's restrooms right there to make them larger and more appropriate for kindergarten programming. Um, this room right here, although nice for something like this, is very underutilized. Uh, Mr. Craney, our principal, would tell you that they might have a staff meeting in here. Um, it's not really ideal for bringing classes in, partly because of the, the levels. So this is a pretty underutilized space, as well as um, where the old office used to be, which is on the other side of these walls here. Uh, again, very underutilized spaces. What's being proposed is currently music and art, our specials classes are in the middle of the building. Uh, we would move those over to this part of the building and redesign this, remodel this section to house art and music, um, and then build some collaborative spaces in the middle of the building that the classrooms could share and, and in an attempt to replicate um, what you see at the other elementaries where you have um, access to not only just the classroom, but classes can come together in a larger space to work together, or um, you might have a specialist, like a special education teacher who needs to work specifically with a single student or a small group of students, instead of that student having to go across the building to um, find that teacher, that teacher comes to them and works outside of their classroom, and kids miss less instructional time. Um, so we would do that and then remodel the rest of the, the space as well as remodel the library to, to again, bring it similarly to what you see at the other buildings. Um, parking at this building is challenging, uh, so we would attempt to try to increase some parking here as well. Uh, I think kind of a running joke here at Gahara is if you leave to run an errand at lunch or go grab a lunch, you're not guaranteed to have a spot when you come back um, because parking is that tight here. Middle school. As I mentioned, uh, we would close the Holm Education Center, where my office, business services, human resources, special ed, uh, curriculum, technology are housed. Uh, what's proposed in this plan is that the older section of the building, which is currently where seventh and eighth grade are housed, um, district office administration would take probably a quarter of that of this portion of that building. Not the whole building, just the part that's being renovated, and we can uh, remodel that to become the new district office. 
I can tell you selfishly, I, I was previously before uh, uh, being a superintendent, I was a middle school principal. Uh, personally, I'm excited about the prospects of being close to middle schoolers again, hearing kind of the hustle and bustle that you hear in the hallways. Um, so selfishly, that's an exciting possibility for me. Uh, but we would utilize this space. It actually lends itself well because of uh, the way it's designed with parking and entrances to the building. We would be able to design this to be able to section it off from the rest of the building. Uh, we would go ahead and then remodel the rest of that 7-8 section. Uh, you, may have, you may recall back in October, that's the portion of the building where we had a mold issue. Um, so we would remodel that. Uh, there are some small classrooms and small office spaces that are either being underutilized because they're too small to bring classrooms in, or it might be too small of a classroom that we're trying to force fit a class into and it doesn't really meet our educational program. Um, so we would do some heavier construction to build some, some better uh, instructional spaces that can be uh, better utilized and more uh, readily utilized. So that's the interior. We would not touch the 5-6 section of the building. This building would become 7th and 8th grade only uh, with a portion of it um, for a district office, uh, which dramatically increases the capacity of this building to uh, about 400 students, or I'm sorry, about 800 students. Um, in addition, uh, the school district constantly has need for field space. We know that our community also has need for field space, whether it's for our phi -ed programming or it's for our middle school and high school athletic programming. Uh, when they built this 5-6 this section, a lot of dirt was moved up into this area and, and creating these fields. Um, we would actually, I don't know if they, how well they graded and seeded it at the time, you know, almost two decades ago, but what we would like to do is regrade and reseed these fields so that they're safe and appropriate for us to use. Uh, we envision bringing over um, high school practices into this area. We currently rent from St. Olaf's for, to, for a soccer practice field. Um, once these are regraded and reseeded, we could use this for soccer, lacrosse, football practices over here for freshman JV um, competitions. Because we know that we would bring uh, our programming over here to accommodate our student athletes, um, we would, we're proposing adding a restroom storage uh, addition onto the middle schools to avoid having those student athletes have to go into the building. It's better secured that way um, off hours. Um, from a community standpoint, this would be a benefit to the community. Uh, if any of our youth athletic programs or even adult programming want to reserve this field, they'd be able to have access to uh, restroom facilities uh, there as well. I do understand that this is, and I've never gone there, I usually go over to Olam to watch the 4th of July fireworks, but apparently this is a pretty popular place for um, fireworks uh, viewing during the 4th of July. So there's some community community benefits uh, to what's being proposed here as well. High school, probably the most complicated and probably the most extensive work that's going to be done um, in this entire project. Um, at the high school, there exists a, none of, uh, a, a number of ADA compliance issues inside the building, and an example would be restrooms, as well as outside the building. When you look outside the building, uh, currently, uh, very few of our fields are ADA accessible. If you were going to watch a softball competition and you had mobility issues, um, it would be a challenge. There's no paved viewing areas. Uh, there's no paved walkway to get there. Uh, we have a lot of overflow parking that occurs on North Town, which um, the village doesn't love. I can tell you from the school district's perspective, we're not in love with it either because it just creates a lot of potential issues that uh, we prefer to avoid. But in looking at what we would do at the high school, I mentioned that the pool and the issues at the pool. So what's being proposed is we would vacate the pool area, which is right here. Next to the pool is the Old North Gym. We would vacate that as well. Next to that is the uh, current cafeteria and then the little theater. We would remodel and repurpose that entire area. We would turn the pool into a multi-purpose uh, wellness fitness room. We would take the gym, a portion of the gym, and move the library there. Uh, it does have the ceiling capacity, but that, that potentially could be two levels, um, which would uh, allow us the ability to create small study areas as well as large 
uh, group project uh, collaborative areas as well, in addition to your typical library, access to library materials and technology. Um, we would then also further expand the cafeteria and commons utilizing the little theater, the existing little theater, the cafeteria space and part of the gym to create a larger common space cafeteria food service area. Um, we do utilize the little theater. Having that kind of elevated stage is useful. So one of the things we're envisioning is opening that area up, still having maybe a, a, an elevated stage area that for the high school, they could bring multiple classrooms to during the school day and utilize that space. From the school district's perspective, it'd be a great place for us to hold professional, large professional development. Um, from a community standpoint, it would make a great uh, venue to host community meetings or uh, community presentations. So this whole, this whole area here would be pretty extensive renovations. To increase uh, classroom capacity at the high school, this is currently our science hallway. We would reconfigure and do some heavy remodeling to update our current science labs and, and classrooms. By doing that reconfiguration, we should be able to increase classroom capacity. Another way we'll increase classroom capacity is um, reconvert or convert the existing library space into instructional space. Um, in addition, if any of you have been to the high school, it's pretty easy to start walking through the high school and find yourself at a dead end. Um, to improve traffic flow there, uh, we would build a new um, corridor along this path here, creating more of a circular flow. Uh, this would support where the new entrance would be. We would move the entrance off of Jefferson Street over to the Circle Drive. Really makes a more natural um, kind of funneling point for those visitors coming to the, to the high school. Typically, they would be coming in to access either the PAC, the competition gym, or it would allow them to, once they've gone through the main office, access kind of that larger uh, common space community area as well. So we would renovate to move the, the main office and the, the secure entrance, main secure entrance off of the Circle Drive. Um, as I mentioned, oh, uh, where the existing office is, which wasn't, uh, which was recently renovated not that long ago, we have an alternative high school program in that building outside of the Holm Education, Education Center um, that services annually anywhere from, I don't know, a dozen to two dozen students. Those students have flexible schedules. Some of them do come over to the high school for their elective programming. Uh, we would move our alternative education program into that part of the building, into the, where the office currently is. It allows them to have their own entrance that they can then monitor. Um, and then it allows uh, it eliminates the need for those students to have to travel back and forth to get access to some of those elective courses. Um, as I mentioned, we would be losing the pool, vacating the pool and losing uh, a gym. To recoup the pool and the gym, we would build an addition onto the high school. Uh, currently, this is a parking lot. We would build an addition there. Uh, we currently have a six-lane pool. The plan would be to build an eight-lane pool, so expand the pool to eight lanes. Uh, we currently do not have a diving well, so we can't hold post sectionals. I know that our youth programming isn't, uh, the DFAC isn't able to hold um, competition meets here. Um, by having an eight lane pool, as well as building it to the depth to be able to host diving, typically those are done at different times anyway, so that it makes sense. There was uh, originally a desire to have a diving well. This was a nice compromise and a way to reduce the, the overall cost by building an eight-lane pool with the depth to, to be able to ha uh, have diving there too. In addition, in this gym, we would have uh, new locker rooms, large four large locker room spaces for um, Phi Ed and our athletic teams, and then a three-station gym um, in that addition. Um, because we anticipate that this will be a heavily used area not only by by our school district programming, by, but by the community. Currently, our pool um, is open at 5.30 in the morning and closes probably close to 10, around 10 o'clock every evening during the weekday. Um, but during the school day, there's no access to the pool because of our security protocol. It'd just be impossible to allow any kind of community access during the school day. But by design, we will be able to design this to secure this from the rest of the building. We envision being able to partner with Park and Rec 
and potentially the senior center to offer um, access to the pool when we're not utilizing, when the school district's not utilizing it, which is significant chunks of the day. Uh, I would anticipate that they that Park and Rec could offer uh, little type swim lessons, water aerobics, um, senior swim. So we would we would want to be able to have that be accessible during the school day. There's that potential for the, the three station gym area, but that's not sure yet. That will be dependent on how that's designed. Because we know that this will likely be something heavily used by the community during the school day and especially on weekends, we're looking at changing the flow of in and out access to the high school. We would still have student parking up here, um, but we're looking to have access off of Northtown Road and create kind of a U drive in and out access off of Northtown Road. Uh, we try to recoup parking that we lose by this addition and maybe even pick up additional parking um, so that we can have in and out traffic and ample parking to support the needs of that addition. Um, as I mentioned, 88 issues exist um, on our campus. To address that, uh, we're proposing reconfiguring particularly the softball diamonds, turning their backstops, which are currently here, and putting it to butt up against the uh, baseball. So what you usually like to see is kind of that cloverleaf um, format so that all the backstops are kind of against each other and then the spectator viewing is all in the same area. This would then allow us to be able to pave a spectator viewing area, thus making it ADA compliant. And then on top of it, we pave it so that they have restroom and concession access to the addition. Um, instead of currently, what we do during the spring season is bring a porta potty out there. Um, we would like the varsity baseball and the varsity softball um, which, uh, you know, to some people might seem um, a luxury, but I will tell you that during the spring, and this spring is going to be an unbelievable challenge, and last spring was equally the same challenge because of the weather. Um, we find ourselves having double headers. We're either pulling kids out of school early, or when we have inclement weather, we're canceling games at noon at the prospects of that inclement weather. By having the ability to light fields, we can postpone that decision about cancellations, or we know that we can potentially start games later. Um, from a community aspect, you know, we have hometown baseball here. This would allow them access to our fields. This, by having lighted fields, it actually increases the ability for community access because there's more hours that it can be utilized. Uh, we would also go ahead and put lights on the tennis courts. Again, um, similar issues around our tennis program. And I think from a community standpoint, to be able to utilize that into the evening uh, is a benefit for the community as well, as well as supports our programming needs. And then parking is an issue uh, with our, you know, over a thousand students. We already have students who aren't able to get parking permits, so we find them parking on uh, the residential streets. Um, so we're proposing adding additional parking space to accommodate that. It probably won't be able to accommodate all the parking needs of the district, but it certainly does help to increase parking. Um, so I mentioned all of those pieces there that will be done at the high school. So one of the questions that we've had is why not, you know, if you're doing that much work, why not just build a new high school? Uh, the CAC thought of that. As I mentioned, they thought about building a new high school. One of the challenges is the district doesn't currently own a large enough piece of land. You need about 80 acres for uh, a high school of 1,600 students which is what we would be targeting and which is what the capacity of this building becomes. Um, so we don't currently own that, so we'd have to secure and, and buy land to do that. Um, in addition, the cost of a, of a high school for 1,600 students right now is about $140 million. A good example of that is just to look to our neighbors in Sun Prairie. Their referendum question is for a new high school. The referendum question is for about $164 million, I believe is the number. Um, and, and the majority of that is the cost of the new high school. So when the CAC uh, was informed of the cost of building a new high school at $140 million, they really felt like there were more uh, economical ways to, be, to address more needs throughout the district. And to their credit, I think they did a good job of that. Uh, as you can see, our capacity increases by what is being proposed um, based off of the projections. Our high school becomes a high school of, uh, with a capacity of 1,600. Our middle school can handle uh, up to 800 students. Uh, the near intermediate can handle um, just under 1,200. 
Uh, and then at the elementary levels, um, we should have capacity by pulling fourth grade out to get us to those projections. Again, 2030 is, is kind of a point in time. It doesn't mean that that's the exact point in time. Uh, I will say, though, the CAC did struggle with seeing that by 2030, there's going to you know, potentially be the need for a new elementary school. They struggled with, do you, do you consider maybe putting that into this? But we would have been under capacity for too long a period of time <coughs> that that didn't seem reasonable. And, what, and there are some other ways that we can address some elementary capacity issues with redrawing boundaries, um, boundary exceptions, that maybe we can prolong that. And at some point in time, the community is just going to have to have that discussion. If that Pumpkin Hollow area starts to develop, that's when uh, there'll be a need to have that conversation, hopefully in 2030, about uh, elementary capacity. So looking at the cost of this, which is, I will be the first to admit and the first to acknowledge, this is a considerable ask of our community to make this kind of investment in our schools. Um, the new intermediate school, 57.4 million. The renovations at the middle school, 7.1. Uh, the renovations at here at Yahara, 4.1. And all the renovation work at the high school comes to, again, $60.4 million for a total of $129 million. The uh, recommendation that the board approved would be that we would utilize $4 million from our current fund balance of about 16 to 18 million. We have a fund balance of about 16 to 18 million. We would pull uh, 4 million from that and, and decrease the amount we would have to borrow to 125 million. Again, frame of reference, 140 million for just a high school. Um, this 125 million, albeit a considerable ask and a considerable investment, does touch um, a lot of, uh, really all levels of the school district and really would position the district well into the near future and hits many of, um, of the needs that exist today and will exist in the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, as you know, there are, are two questions, or you may not know, there are two questions on the ballot. The first is that capital question. The second is an operational. Because we'd be bringing on a new intermediate school and new square footage at the high school, there is cost of maintenance, of utilities, of additional staffing necessary. Um, so we built that in. We did take into consideration we'd be taking two smaller, older schools, less efficient schools offline. That was factored into that. So of that two and a half million dollar um, operational question, a million and a half of it would go towards the operation of the new space coming online. But this construction project would take uh, upwards of three years. The new intermediate and the addition would easily take two years to come online. So what we would propose is using first two years of that operational referendum to further reduce how much we borrow. Take that one and a half million each of those years and reduce the borrowing um, to 122. This is what the capital question will look like. Again, you'll see the, the dollar amount, the purpose of it here uh, for the new intermediate, um, renovations at a number of other buildings, um, and site improvements as well. So I mentioned that there's that operational question of two and a half million dollars. One and a half million we know goes towards the operation of new, new facilities coming online. The other million is targeted to do strategic things around program staffing and the district's ability to attract and retain high quality staff. Uh, we pulled together a task force at the similar time as this other CAC was going on. Um, and the task force was responsible at looking at you know, this district does, does well, but if we want to move to that kind of great level, are we really positioned to, uh, to make that move? Do we have the staffing, do we have the programming um, to, to accomplish that? So at a very high level, that group looked at these indicators, financial indicators, student achievement, staffing levels, and hiring trends. Uh, one of the biggest things that they looked at, this is our uh, revenue limit per pupil. This is the our district. We're second from the bottom in Dane County. This is a comparison to Dane County. This light purple is the Dane County average. This is how much we, um, in essence, get per student, and this is what comprises our operational budget. So when we started studying this, we started to realize that even in comparison to the Dane County average, that's 
That's about a $3 million difference, a little over a $3 million difference. If we were funded at this same level, we'd have an additional $3 million. So we start to wonder, okay, what, what are we missing when we don't have that same kind of revenue um, that other districts in Dane County have? We looked at staffing levels. And what we found was that we have uh, just below McFarland, who has a virtual school, which skews their student-to-staff ratio, we actually have the highest, or the second highest, uh, student-to-staff ratio. Um, and as we started to take a further look at that, we started to think, are our class sizes too big? Uh, looking at our class sizes, they're actually right on target and very comparable to what we see across Dade County. Uh, what we began to realize was that when we started to look at similar districts to us, like Monroe, who demographically looks very much like us, um, we started to identify programs that either they had um, staffed differently um, or they had programs that didn't exist in our district. Uh, whether they were programs like um, English language learner programs to support those students or instructional improvement programs to support uh, teachers and their practice, we started to begin to identify programs that didn't exist in our, our district because we just quite honestly weren't able to fund them. In addition, we, this group study, um, for those of you in the private sector, have experienced this probably for the last five, 10 years, a very competitive employment market. Um, this has existed already, actually, in other parts of the state and is really starting to hit Dane County. As an example of how competitive it's become, an elementary applicant pool back in 2006, we post it, we get 244 applicants. That typically was the largest applicant. You know, you, you post an elementary position, it always got the largest applicant. A decade later, we saw it drop to 80. This last hiring season, last spring, last summer, we had 30, these are real numbers, we had 36 applicants for an elementary position that we posted last year. What's challenging there is, that's Dane County. Think of all the elementary schools just in Dane County, and I'm, I'm confident in saying that there are probably 36 vacancies throughout Dane County for elementary positions. So that just speaks to how competitive um, it is. Um, and I will tell you that in all of the things that we do, whether it's focus groups, whether it's the framework, the survey, um, our community has said having high quality staff working with our kids in our buildings is a priority to them. Uh, again, whether we're working with focus groups and we've asked them for their feedback, whether it was the recent framework this last October, um, or the recent community survey we did back in November, it always came back that having high quality staff in our buildings, and that's not just the teachers in front of kids, we're talking custodians. We had a maintenance position two years ago that was open for an entire year just because we could not fill it. Um, so it doesn't matter what position you're talking about in the district, all of them are important and our community believes that we should have high quality people around our children. Whether you're talking that, that demographic of non-parent, non-staff, they don't have anything really invested because they don't have kids in the, in the district, they, they approved having high quality staff at 62%. Uh, parents, 78%, which is what you would expect. And overall residents in responding to that survey, 76% felt that that was a priority. So based off of what they studied, that task force recommended that the, that the school board really needs to consider getting additional operational funds. We tested on that survey um, 500,000 to a million. Based off of the response on the survey, based off of the information we, we studied in that task force, the administration made a recommendation to the school board to pursue an additional million dollars, which is what you see on the operational question. What that million dollars will go towards would be to support the district's efforts to be competitive in an increasingly competitive employment market, as well as to be very strategic in staffing programs that will support student achievement as well as improve instructional practices. We don't know exactly what those are. We're still looking at other districts and trying to identify what those programming, uh, what those programs might be, um, but very much focused on student achievement and improved instructional practices. So that operational funding question, as I mentioned, one and a half million would go towards the operation of new square footage coming online. Um, just as a, another frame of reference, we would have a new construction square footage, over 300,000 square feet coming online. Um, in remodeling, that's how this comprehensive this entire proposal is, 
we have an additional 300,000 square feet that we would be remodeling. That is, looking at those kind of numbers tells you how expansive and comprehensive this, uh, this uh, proposed project would be. And then this additional million for program staffing. This is what the operational question looks like for two and a half million to support um, what I've already mentioned about new uh, square footage coming online as well as supporting uh, staffing, uh, programming, and retaining high quality staff. The tax impact, as I mentioned, again, considerable investment that we're asking our community to make. So for the facility project at the $125 million, that's the $180 per $100,000 property value impact. Looking, if you add the two operational pieces together, which it is one piece, but we break it apart so there's an understanding of what makes up that $2.5 million, brings it to $274 per 100000 As I mentioned, if both questions pass, um, we would utilize the first two years of that operational to further reduce what we borrow, bringing it to $265 uh, per $100,000 impact. This is just another way to look at that, break it down per year, per month. Um, you can find online a tax calculator to get an estimate of, of the tax impact on your uh, property. Um, it really is important to note that much of this, and you can ask um, our representative from Baird or Kathy Davis, our business manager, these, these estimates are very conservative, and it's important to note that. Um, I think we have a responsibility to give you worst case scenario. Um, so there are, there are conservative factors uh, in these calculations. As an example, we're factoring in, I think, five, five and a half percent uh, interest rates. Um, the going rate for uh, a district like ours with our credit rating uh, is really closer to three and a half to four um, percent. It, it takes into account lower uh, property value growth than we've seen in this area. In the last three years, we've seen 8, 9, 10% growth in our community. This takes into account 1, 2, 3% growth. So that does impact what you're seeing there, um, which does create, uh, again, a, a more conservative estimate. Uh, but I think that's important to note so that you have an understanding of what that is. Now, does that change it from 265 to 80? No. But it certainly gives you uh, kind of some context to these numbers. Uh, to further give you context to um, our the tax impact, this is our district and our mill rate compared to the rest of Dane County. We are third from the bottom currently in our mill rate. Um, as many of you may or may not know, this last November a number of referendums passed in Dane County. Uh, in anticipating and estimating that impact of those referendums on those districts, a Middleton Cross Plains passed their referendum. We estimated it would add $1.64 to their current $9.59 mill rate, moving them up um, over $11. Um, Oregon passed a, a referendum. Uh, that would move them up to $12.70. Um, Monona Grove passed a referendum, moving them up to $13.50. As I mentioned, Sun Prairie has a referendum. If theirs were to pass, their uh, mill rate would move up to about uh, 1350 as well. So certainly our mill rate would increase, uh, wouldn't move us up to the very top, would move us above the average. Um, we would anticipate somewhere, you know, kind of top five maybe. So I've given you a lot of information. Some of the questions that we fielded, uh, you know, have been around this extensive, this comprehensive of a, of a project, how long would it take, when would they start? It would take nine months to a year just to design all of this work. We would anticipate that an approved referendum would mean uh, that we would begin breaking ground the spring and summer of 2020. Uh, we would hope to have the intermediate and the addition of the high school online by the fall of 2021, and then completion of the entire project by the end of the summer of 2022. Uh, a project like this to address all the needs that we're talking about takes three years, um, which gets us pretty close to when we would start to experience the pressure in our facilities. So um, if you want more information, you should have all received a newsletter. Well, we know it's hitting the mailboxes this week. Some of you have already received it. If you have it, it should be coming. Um, the second of two newsletters um, should be hitting your mailboxes. 
uh, you want more information, I'd encourage you to go online. Uh, a great section online is the FAQ section. Um, lots of questions that we feel that we try to answer because we figure people have similar questions. Um, so we'd encourage you to go there and, and look at that FAQ. This is the last of our informational sessions. Um, we've had pretty good turnout. Uh, we've, I've also been presenting at the Chamber, American Legion, a variety of other municipalities. So try to get out there because at the end of the day, the school district's responsibility is to make sure that you have the information necessary um, to make an informed decision about this referendum. Okay, that's it. That's all the information I have for you.